Hi there, welcome to your lecture for week 11 on the young British artist. This is one of the phenomena of the 1990s, and in fact, probably one of the most important phenomena of the 1990s in contemporary art is the explosion of interest in and activity in art making in London. Uh, London has become, in the last decade and a half, one of the major centers for international contemporary art. And it starts with this phenomenon of these early 1990s art students that get the nickname YBAs, or Young British Artists. Now, when they start out in the early 90s, we're talking like 91, 92, 93, when they're all art students at various places in the city of London, they're in their early 20s, you know, they're pretty young, they're kind of up and coming. Um, they're still around. Some of the major players of this, um, of this group are still around, but now they're not really the young British artists anymore because it's almost 20 years later, so they're in their 40s and um, they're the establishment, but they are still incredibly important. So there's several people we'll be looking at today, including Damien Hurst, um, Tracy Emin, Chris O'Feely, who have continued to be important in um, the art world and particularly in contemporary art in London. It's also important to know the mechanisms of art uh, and art promotion in London that have become part of the international art scene. So a couple of um, people and terms and names that I want you to know from today. Charles Saatchi, who is the owner, uh, or one of the owners of Saatchi & Saatchi, which is a major international advertising firm, became a real collector of, of contemporary art starting in the early 90s. And he was one of the first people to patronize or to buy art from this up-and-coming group of artists known who get the nickname Young British Artists. Uh, his gallery, which is online now as well as in person, is an important center for taste making now. Um, people look at what Charles Saatchi buys and then they buy uh, the same artists that he has purchased. He also, or his gallery, also promotes up-and-comers. Uh, in fact, there's a free gallery site where you can, as a student, post your own work from anywhere in the world to this kind of virtual gallery that Saatchi has created. He's a little bit controversial because of some of the stuff that he's picked, uh, and sometimes people think that, you know, and, and this is actually a long-standing issue in the art world, that money can't buy taste, you know, so some people look at the stuff that he's purchased and the stuff that, because he's purchased it, has now become really important in the art world, and people say, oh, the emperor has no clothes. Uh, well, I'll let you decide that for yourself, but I mean, it's important to know that that's kind of one of the controversies about Saatchi is, well, does he just have more money than sense? Uh, or, you know, does money, just being able to buy something, does that mean that it's art? So that's one thing to keep uh, in mind. But Saatchi's, or Saatchi's become really influential and his galleries become really influential in the world of art. The first place where the young British artists start to get attention is at a show that was organized by this group of students that was called Freeze. Uh, comes from the idea of this taking a perfect moment and capturing it in that instant, you know, the, the, uh, a frozen moment in time. Uh, the Freeze show was happened in 1988, and it was organized by students who were not able to get their work into regular galleries, so they organized their own alternative exhibition in basically a warehouse, an old warehouse, and uh, sent, out, sent out invitations because they... They had some connections to the museum and gallery world. The word got out, and uh, important collectors started coming to see the freeze show that was organized by the students. And then um, purchases were made from there. And then that was what launched the careers of several of the important young British artists, including Damien Hurst, who's the one that we'll look at the most here today. By 10 years later, 1997-1998, there was a show organized by the Saatchi Gallery of his collection and called Sensation, and it was kind of a retrospective of the last 10 years of contemporary British artists. And uh, Saatchi, his gallery, organized this show and sent it to uh, America. It was it opened at the Brooklyn Museum. It had been it had been in London. It came to Brooklyn, and it was the subject of a great deal of controversy both in London and in New York when it came to Brooklyn. The then mayor of New York, Rudy Giuliani, said that he would pull funding from the Brooklyn Museum of Art for showing this show because he found a couple of pieces particularly um, offensive. So that's another issue that comes up with the young British artists is not only is the media that they're using really art with a capital A, but also um, is the, su the stuff that they're making art or just offensive. So a couple of things for you to look to think about as we're looking at these guys today. Uh, another 
important term to know or important kind of group to know is a group called the Stuckists, who are actually from the group of young British artists. They're people who were students with the Brit young, this group of young British artists and so, in some cases friends or lovers of them. And um, But in, in um, sometime in the early to mid 90s, there was an argument that sprang up between this group that started to call themselves the Stuckists and the more new media kinds of young British artists. Uh, and they, they took their name from a fight that one of the young British artists had with one of the Stuckists, where she said to him, you're stuck. If you're all you can do is painting, you're stuck, stuck, stuck. You're stuck in the past. And so the Stuckists took that as their kind of starting point. We're stuck in the past. And they issue a couple of manifestos in the 90s saying things like, if it isn't painting, it isn't art, you know, or, and um, they've continued to show um, or, or continue to kind of do these performative interventions in the contemporary art world of London. They show up and protest every year at the awarding of the Turner Prize. The Turner Prize itself is something to know about. It is given by the Tate Gallery. The Tate is this major national public museum that collects contemporary art, and they award a massive prize every year named after Jam W. Turner, the great painter, uh, the Turner Prize, which is awarded to an up-and-coming young British artist every year. Uh, and the Stuckists show up every year to protest because every year, one year one of the finalists for the Turner Prize was a guy who had done an entire giant sculpture out of um, stuffed the taxidermied rats. You know, he called it like a Death Star of rats. Uh, and so that kind of thing, of course, engenders protest on the part of peop the people who call themselves the Stuckists over the issue of what is really art. So those are a couple of terms to know. I should have put the Turner Prize on here, so um, keep that in your notes, right? The Turner Prize, another element of uh, the, the apparatus of the art world in the 90s and in the 2000s. Probably the most famous piece done by one of the young British artists is this piece, which is a um, large tank of, of formaldehyde in which the body of a shark has been suspended. It was... Um, it was created in 1991 by Damien Hirst, who again is one of the most famous of the young British artists. And the title of this, you do need to know the long title of this, not, not shark or anything like that. It is the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. So this shark is a kind of interesting, um, kind of interesting example of Damien Hirst's work. It is typical of his early work in which he does a lot of this kind of, I mean, you might think of this as being in the tradition of the found object or the ready-made a la Marcel Duchamp. Even with Jeff Koons in the 1980s, we saw like the, the um, basketball suspended in a tank. Here, uh, Damien Hirst always takes this to the next level. And one of the things that we find with the, the work of the young British artists is there, and really into the 2000s with, with contemporary artists generally, is lots of media that you might think are hard to curate and hard to keep. Um, people, famously, another young British artist did a sculpture of a self portrait of himself in blood that had to be kept frozen. That was purchased by Charles Saatchi, and then somebody cleaning the Saatchi gallery accidentally unplugged the freezer and melted the sculpture. Um, and there's lots of these examples of media that are really hard to curate. In fact, the, the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living was purchased in, um, uh, in 2007 and <clears throat> was already decaying. Um, when Hearst started doing this, he was no expert in the, in this kind of taxidermy. And so he just thought, okay, well, I'll buy formaldehyde, suspend the shark, and that'll be it. Uh, unfortunately, though, you have to prepare the shark. You have to actually, um, I, I don't know all the details of this, but you actually have to, you know, um, um, almost taxidermy the body of the shark before you put it in formaldehyde. You can't just plunk a, a big piece of meat in a tank and expect it to stay or to expect it not to decay. You have to actually um, inject the meat with the formaldehyde and whatnot. So this shark was deteriorated to such a point that in 2007 the tank was very cloudy and you couldn't really see the shark. So when this was purchased, um, he went ahead and agreed to up to, to replace the shark, replace the formaldehyde, to kind of redo this piece, which of course also raises all sorts of interesting issues about um, where the work of art resides. Is it in the idea or the execution? Um, so uh, there's also some issues with where did you get the shark? The, um, 
original shark. Oh, excuse me, it was purchased in 2004 and then restored in 2007. Hearst had bought the first shark uh, and then its replacement from an Australian vendor. Uh, the tiger shark is the kind of shark that's represented here, and it is an in, uh, a threatened species. It's one step away from being on the endangered species list. Uh, so, you know, there's all sorts of issues with, with that are raised with the work like this. I should mention to you, by the way, that when this was sold in 2004, it was purchased for $8.3 million. And uh, the, purchase, the purchaser actually agreed that he would pay for all the maintenance and upkeep of the uh, piece when he purchased it. Uh, okay, so anyway, the, the, what's typical of Hearst's early work here is this use of a, a very different medium and then engaging in the title and then in the actual work itself with questions of mortality. That is a constant theme that runs through all of Hearst's work. Here are a couple of other examples of his early work. Uh, Mother and Child Divided here from 93. This is literally, I mean, and there's a little pun here going on because you have a calf and then a mother cow. They are divided from one another. They are also split in half. Uh, so they're divided and they're divided. Uh, Hearst always works with this kind of theme uh, and you can you know, judge for yourself whether you like this kind of stuff or hate it. It's obviously very um, conceptually oriented and in fact, a lot of the time Hearst does not do um, Hearst does not do any of the actual construction of the stuff that is um, put out under his name. Let's see here, Away from the Flock, another one of his taxidermy formaldehyde pieces. Um, oh, so we'll look a little more at Hearst here in a little bit. Here is another one of the young British artists who makes a name for herself in the 90s, actually wins the Turner Prize in the 90s. Uh, this piece called My Bed from 1999 is a piece that um, her, or Emin was inspired to do, and she was a, a girl member of the Young British Artists, basically. Um, she had had a breakup with a boyfriend and then, you know, was depressed, had spent a, some time kind of in her apartment moping about it, and decided at the end of that period that this would be a really great installation piece because this detritus from this period of mourning is very, you know, it's personal, it's tangible, it's an expressive, it is her life at that time in a nutshell. When it was put on display, of course, some people loved it, some people hated it. I should mention to you that, I mean, what we've got going on here are actually Emmons' bed, dirty sheets, dirty underwear, empty vodka bottles, um, used sorry to say this, okay, use tampons, use condoms, um, just the detritus of her life. Uh, actually, Charles Saatchi purchased this and then installed it in a special room in his house, in one of the bedrooms in his house. He's quite wealthy, and he has a very large mansion with, you know, umpteen bedrooms in it, uh, which also raises the question then, well, how do you know whether this is actually an art installation or just a messy room in Charles Saatchi's house, right? Uh, when this was installed, while it was on display in the Tate Gallery f during the period when Emin was a finalist for the Turner Prize, two um, Chinese-British artists uh, performed a performance piece they called Two Naked, Mo Two Naked Men Jumping in Tracy Emin's Bed, where they literally, they went in the gallery, they went behind the velvet ropes, you know, they stripped down and they got in the bed and they started jumping up and down. Uh, and before they were shortly later, you know, apprehended by guards and carted off from the premises. But they called that their their modification, their performance piece on top of Tracy's bed. So I think you can see where this kind of work is going uh, and how the British are in the 90s taking um, many trends that we have seen developing in the contemporary period and really pushing them to their limits, the idea of the found object, the blurring between personal and um, and personal and um, art, the performance, um, the 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 blurring of the boundaries between art and life, all of these things are be ta being taken really to their logical extremes in this period by the YBAs. Let's see. Here's Tracy Emmons' tent. That's the nickname of it. Everyone I have ever slept with, 1963 to 1995. Uh, she was born in 1963, so this is not just people she's had sex with. It's literally everyone who she's ever shared a bed with. So there are names embroidered on the inside of the tent. 
and then you can see the outside of the tent, which was just a purchased ready-made tent that she then went ahead and embroidered on. Uh, a little bit a la, or, or and quilted on, a, a little bit a la Judy Chicago, but here not with a particularly political purpose in mind. It's a much more personal and intimate purpose here. Um, this tent was meant for you in the gallery to go in. As you can see from this shot here, most of the names are actually inside the tent. So you have to go inside the tent to get the full story. And it literally, it has, you know, the name of her grandma and her mom, people who she shared a bed with, as well as people who she had uh, intimate sexual relationships with. And you can imagine, this is a, a pretty intimate sort of experience. You crawl into the tent. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of um, work. I mean, it, it has that ready-made element to it. It also has a performative and collaborative element to it. Uh, breaking the boundaries down between art and life. Again, all these trends of the contemporary period that we've seen uh, kind of meeting together in this period of the young British artists. This was also purchased by Charles Saatchi and it was put away in a warehouse and that warehouse burned down to the ground about three years ago, so it no longer exists. Here's the inside of the tent that lists people again. And um, Oh, by the way, Billy Childish is one of the fellow art students that Tracy Emin actually had been boyfriend-girlfriend with for a while, and he was one of the founding members of the Stuckists. Another member of this group, and again, I think you can see how the young British artists also have this kind of sense of humor, right? This is Sarah Lucas's photograph, Self-Portrait with Fried Eggs. Uh, Sarah Lucas continues to be an artist who works a lot with uh, gender identity for for something or, or as a subject matter and here's her piece from the early 90s that really got lots of attention oh naturel from 1994 just a mattress on the floor that she's added some fruit and simple objects to where it doesn't take too much of a stretch of the imagination to see these in an anthropomorphic way that is to see the fruit that's placed there uh, and the the bucket as kind of um, analogs for male and female genitalia, right? So you've got a kind of playful and jokey uh, installation slash sculpture slash ready-made that uh, Sarah Lucas has created here. Uh, one of the pieces from this group that became particularly controversial in the years of the sensation show in America is this piece by Chris Ophelia called Holy Virgin Mary from 1996. Chris Ophelia is a British-born um, English, English person. However, his parents are Nigerian. So his parents were recent immigrants before he was born. They're from Nigeria, which is on the west coast of Africa. And growing up, Chris Ophelia always kind of had some contact or, or some sense of um, his Nigerian heritage. Like many immigrant families around the world, you know, his parents did retain a lot of traditions as well as then having this kid who's growing up basically as a modern British, or as a, as a, a, a British kid as opposed to growing up as a Nigerian kid. When he went to art school, he decided he thought he, one of the things he wanted to do was draw on the traditions of his parents' culture. And so um, there are a couple of things about this Holy Virgin Mary that are um, more sort of referencing Nigeria. The color, the patterning, you can barely see here on the, the background of the oil painting that reference West African textiles, um, the bright use of color, of course, portraying um, the Holy Virgin Mary with very exaggerated sort of African features. Um, the thing that was particularly controversial that is, again, this is typical of the young British artist sort of um, working method, is the, the shock value here. Uh, there are lots of little butterflies surrounding the Virgin Mary, and if you look closely, you can just make out that these butterflies are actually created from cutouts from pornographic magazines. So they are um, crotch shots and buttocks from porn magazines that he's cut out into little butterflies and stuck up all around um, the painting of the Virgin Mary. So that was one thing that people in the States in particular found quite offensive. This was the thing that Rudy Giuliani was really upset about was this painting. The other thing that Ophelia has done here, and this is a, a very typical part of his uh, working method. This is something, a medium that he uses all the time. You can see that little rose looking thing that is attached to the Virgin Mary's breasts and sticking out, or breast and sticking out from the canvas. 
It's actually a piece of elephant dung that he has affixed to the canvas. Now, Ophelia makes the argument that in the culture of his parents, dung is considered something, uh, a good omen. It's not like people carry it around as a lucky charm or something, but um, elephant dung is considered a good omen because, and this makes sense, right? If creatures in an area have enough to eat, they can poop, right? So that is considered to be a sign that an area is fertile and there's enough vegetation, things like that. Um, so poop is a good sign because it means that the animals in the region have enough to eat, so therefore they can poop. Uh, now, the elephant dung that Chris Ophelia uses is actually from the London Zoo, so it's not like he's going to Africa and getting elephant dung. I mean, he's just sort of taking this, hey, this is, you know, something from my parents' culture and turning it into... Um, turning it into an element of his paintings. And there's a lot of discussion about Ophelia and, you know, is this, I mean, is he British? Is he Nigerian? What's the identity of this person? And I mean, that kind of comes out of the identity politics that's so much a part of art since the 1960s. And he seems to be playing with that a little bit. It's unclear whether he's being sincere about this or whether he's trying to kind of poke people's buttons a little bit with this but I will tell you that even in more recent series of paintings uh, he has continued to use elephant tongue it continues to be an element in his work and in fact he did a recent series called the, La um, the last the upper room which is a recreation of the last supper uh, and each painting is set on a pedestal of two big pieces of elephant dung. So, uh, and that's actually in the Tate Gallery's collection. Uh, so he continues to use that, and it continues to be something that's referenced in his work. Now, you can, you know, love it or hate it, uh, but what I want you to be aware of is that that's a medium he uses, where the source is of that, where, where the idea comes from, and then how that might play into um, identity politics. Oh yeah, here's the upper room where you can see this has actually been installed in a specially constructed room in the Tate Gallery. There are 13 paintings. There are 12, um, six on either side of this long room, and then one <coughs> larger painting at the very end. So what we've got here then is the 12 disciples and Jesus at the Last Supper. However, instead of being pictures of people, these are 12 pictures of monkeys. Um, and here again, people have taken this in different ways and some people it's a and the monkey itself is actually a drawing that had based on a drawing that had been done by Andy Warhol so you've got a real interesting mishmash of things going on here his reuse of a pop art image uh, the incorporation of elephant dung into these paintings the references to West African culture um, the references to European tradition that are all mashed up in this uh, large installation of paintings there's a view of the one side where you can just make it out I think I've got a good close-up somewhere of the monkeys or one of the monkeys so you can see the monkey drawing that he's elaborated on in these paintings and you can just barely see those little um, pedestals on which these paintings are sitting that are made of elephant dung and then the elephant dung affixed to each of the canvases let's see here's the turquoise monkey and one of the 13 monkey paintings in the upper room and again there that is uh, the Annie Warhol drawing that then Ophelia's elaborated on with this kind of textile background and there's the yellow monkey from the same series. And, um, oh, just one last thing about uh, Chris Ophelia's Upper Room, which is from, what, 2004, 2005. Uh, Chris Ophelia started out as one of the young British artists, one of the bad boys, you know. Now he's on the board of the Tate Gallery, and he makes, uh, he makes purchase decisions for the Tate Gallery. Uh, and he has come under fire, and actually <clears throat> the Stuckists have filed formal complaints about the fact that Ophelia is on the board. He makes purchase decisions, or helps to make purchase decisions, and while he was on the board, the board purchased the, the um, upper room for the permanent collection of the Tate Gallery. That at the same time as Ophelia was making public announcements saying that other British artists should donate their work to the Tate because the Tate didn't have a very large budget and that would be sort of a service to the nation. More recently, Damien Hirst, and again, I've said Damien Hirst continues to work with these themes of um, death and mortality and science. In fact, for a brief period in the early 2000s, he... Um, had collaborated with some people on a restaurant called Pharmacy where he did all the installation. So it looks like, I mean, the, the, the restaurant actually was based on a room installation Hearst had done 
uh, that, that looked like a pharmacy filled with bottles. He also did a series of paintings, and this painting was from the pharmacy. Um, the very photorealistic, hyper-realistic close-up painting of pills, as you can see. Now, I should mention that Damien Hirst, like Mark Costabi before him, and others, uh, Andy Warhol, you know, lots of people going back through art history, he does not actually execute these paintings. Um, he hires or has gallery assistants who do it. And um, let me read you a couple of, or a quote from Damien Hirst talking about not this series of paintings, but a previous series of paintings. Uh, he says um, why he only painted five from this previous series. Uh, he had only painted five of them because, pardon me, I'm going to be qu quoting Hirst and cussing here, okay? I couldn't be fucking arse doing it, he says. He described his efforts as shite. They're shit compared to the best person, uh, shit, shit compared to the best person who ever painted spots for me. That was Rachel. She's brilliant. Absolutely fucking brilliant. The best spot painting you can have by me is one painted by Rachel. And, uh, so this is another thing where Hearst is kind of, you know, raising issues that have been in circulation for a long time. Uh, he says... When, once he was asked by an assistant if, um, sh if she could have a painting of his, and he said to her, make one of your own. And she said, no, I want one of yours. And Hearst says, and I'm quoting him here, the only difference between one painted by her and one of mine is the money. Okay. Uh, so Hearst puts emphasis on the real creative act being the conception and not the execution. And again, he's not the first one, but he's certainly one of the most blatant. He says as the progenitor of the idea, he is really the artist. And I'm going to quote him here again. Art goes on in your head. If you said something interesting, that might be a title for a work of art, and I'd write it down. Art comes from everywhere. It's your response to your surroundings. There are ongoing ideas I've been working out for years, like how to make a rainbow in a gallery. I've got a massive list of titles, of ideas for shows, and of works without titles going on in my head. Okay, so it's the idea that is the important thing. And again, here, he does these, or has his assistants do these photorealistic paintings in the early 2000s for this pharmacy series. I've got a couple of other hearsts here for you to look at. The autopsy with sliced human brain. This is done from a photograph. And here again, and this marriage of art and science is something that goes way back in the Western tradition, by the way. So he's not the first or the only um, artist to be working on this kind of theme. And there's a nice close up. And let's see. Uh, probably the most famous of his recent works is this, For the Love of God from 2006. And there's Hearst with For the Love of God. Uh, For the Love of God is a skull that he com had cast and, com and um, recreated in platinum and inset with diamonds. And so that's the uh, result there. He says he got the title from his mom who basically said, uh, for the love of God, Damien, what are you going to do next? So uh, there's a kind of double entendre here because, of course, for the love of God also could sound like a rather religious title. And you've got this, you know, memento mori here, this reminder of death in very glamorous fashion. It could be a comment on the futility of excess and luxury. Um, it could be ironic. It could just be a publicity stunt. You know, Hearst leaves all of these things open. The... Um, Work was done by jewelers, and the paint or the diamonds are set into a platinum cast of the original skull. Um, 8,100 diamonds set into the skull. Hearst says it's a ma it's the maximum I can throw against death. Perhaps that's crass to pit money against death, but it all depends on what it does visually. Um, th this was for sale in 2006, and it was eventually purchased by a consortium of buyers. For, I forget the total sum, it was something like $80 million, a very, very huge sum of money. Let's see, uh, there are also people who've said, oh, maybe he gets his inspiration for something like this from the popular culture. This is a mass-produced brooch on the left, uh, as you can see, a little skull brooch. Uh, Hearst has continued to work with these themes and do these kinds of installations here, Adam and Eve under the table. So there's a kind of story developing here in this installation. This is in Mexico City in 2006. It was installed in a room in the large museum in Mexico City that has 
um, Renaissance paintings in it. And you can see on the wall back there, there's a, a, a I think it's Chronic the Elder, Adam and Eve. And there is his kind of modern take on Adam and Eve with corpses and um, dressed up in modern wedding clothes and having passed out after uh, clearly a lot of drinking and pill taking. Um, so this is, you know, Hearst kind of engaging with or dialoguing with art history. Sacred uh, Eight from 2006, also in Mexico City. It's a uh, dagger piercing the heart of a cow suspended in a vitrine here. Uh, again, working with these classic themes from the history of Western art and then using these rather unorthodox, um, in-your-face sorts of media to create uh, modern versions of these um, of these traditional subjects. So I should mention that, of course, that you're looking at a guy who is very postmodern in his approach. And St. Bartholomew here is a sculpture. Um, St. Bartholomew was flayed or skinned alive, and so that is his uh, modern take on that. It's a steel sculpture. Um, again, he didn't do it. He had it executed. Uh, just a kind of interesting take on the whole tradition there. Oh, and then here I should show you, this is the Stuckist International Gallery reacting against Stuckism. This is a, actually the photo was taken by Charles Thompson, who is one of the Stuckist artists, and this is their, a dead shark is an art. And actually they had borrowed this shark from a nearby scuba shop where it was in the window, and they put it in their window as a, kind of replicating the formaldehyde tank of Damien Hirst's shark and titling it a dead shark is art is an art is just basically a you know protest against the galleries displaying stuff like Damien Hirst. Oh and I've got some nice photos of the jewelers at work on there's the original skull and then there's the platinum cast that um, the drill the holes are being drilled in they're just getting ready to set the diamonds in the skull. Oh. And there you can see the um, cast again. Somebody had asked me about how this was done, so I just had some nice photos showing it in process. And there it is being worked on. And those are the teeth, the actual teeth from the original skull that were going to be set into the platinum cast. And there's the holes in the jawbone for the platinum cast. And there's the diamonds going in.